Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Because there is a static model of the Lysander at the National Aviation Museum in Ottawa, I have gazed upon it many times trying to decide if it is ugly or beautiful. It's kind of ugly. With its corncob fuselage, weird, backward-looking wings, and comically large wheels and rudder fin, it also looks like it would be slaughtered in any combat environment. But sometimes ugly things can end up looking cute, and sometimes all it takes is finding the perfect niche for an aircraft to become a beautiful favorite. Let's take a closer look at the Westland Lysander. Conception. In 1934, the British Air Ministry released specification A.39-34, which was seeking a two-seat Army cooperation airplane. There was a desire to replace the airplane which was occupying this role, which was the Hawker Hector. The Hector, which was a biplane, had only first flown in February 1936, but was already obsolete and deeply disliked by the ground crews because of its complicated and difficult to service 24-cylinder Napier Dagger H configuration engine. They only built 179 of them. When Westland began work on the submission, the Air Ministry was skeptical. William Teddy Petter, the 26-year-old technical director of Westland Aircraft, was quite inexperienced. He had only worked on one other airplane before, and seemed to be more interested in sports cars. And he just happened to be the son of Sir Ernest Petter, who just happened to be one of the founders of Westland Aircraft Works. Smells like nepotism to me, and when young Petter was promoted to director over other more experienced men of the company, feathers were ruffled and several designers resigned. But Petter did seem to have a positive habit of trying to learn things from the ground up. At Westland, before being promoted, he had worked many of the apprentice-type drudgery jobs, and when work began on specification A.3934, Petter started by talking to pilots and ground crew who would ultimately be flying and servicing the machines. Perhaps because of their experience with the Hector, the ground crews requested easier ground maintenance, and pilots were looking for great visibility, slow speed handling, and enhanced short takeoff and landing abilities. Knowing this, it was time to start designing. Design, Prototypes, and Production Westland called the aircraft the P-8, and as it took shape, it was to be a weird-looking bird, with an interesting mix of old-fashioned construction techniques and some really advanced tech. It was to sit upon fixed gear attached to the fuselage by an inverted U-shaped support, which contained internal shock-absorbing springs. The fuselage was formed of steel tubes covered at the front end with an aluminum cowling and side panels, but at the rear, it was fabric-covered. The engine was to be the Bristol Mercury, which was a nine-cylinder, air-cooled, single-row radial engine with poppet valving and a single-speed, centrifugal-type supercharger. Behind the pilot was a seat for the observer gunner, with a mount for a 303-inch Lewis or Vickers K machine gun. But the wings were really where the magic was to happen. They were a weird shape, with a reverse taper towards the root, which makes it look like a gull wing, but it isn't. The wings are supported by struts attached to where the gear is bolted to the fuselage. They contain some very advanced short takeoff and landing features such as fully automatic wing slats and slotted flaps that would extend automatically as the aircraft slowed down. The pilot could focus on the landing as these wing features operated and kept the stall speed at about 65 miles per hour. The pilot could lock the flaps down and he also had control of a variable incidence tailplane. But we need to return to the landing gear again. These big spatted wheels are one of the most distinguishing features of the aircraft when you stand near one. They are also kind of a Swiss Army knife of landing gear. 
Each gear contained a forward-firing 303-inch Browning machine gun and optional stub wings that could be added that would carry 500 pounds of bombs. Bombs could also be carried under the main fuselage. The Air Ministry liked the design and asked for an initial two prototypes. And then what was now called the Lysander, named for a Spartan admiral, entered production in the UK as well as at the National Steel Car Company in Canada. In total, 1,786 were built. Operational History The Lysander entered service in 1938, and when war broke out, began operations in France, the Middle East, and India. They were used for artillery spotting, message dropping, and even some bombing and ground attack. Quite quickly, it was found that they were very vulnerable to Luftwaffe attack, even when escorted by fighters. Following the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force at Dunkirk, they were withdrawn, having lost 118 of the 175 deployed. If that wasn't bad enough, the view of the army was that the Lysander was too fast for artillery spotting, but too slow to avoid fighters too big to hide on a landing field, and too heavy to use on soft ground. The Lysander seemed doomed. But new uses for the Lizzie were now being found. When the UK was under threat of invasion from Germany, the experimental P-12 Delan Lysander was developed in order to carry a powerful four-gun turret in the tail in order to sweep the invasion beaches with fire. When the worries about the invasion ebbed, the project was abandoned. Lysanders operated as target tugs and also for air-sea rescue. Canada received about 100 Lizzies from the UK and built another 225 themselves under contract. The RCAF used them for everything from the usual Army cooperating role to anti-submarine, search and rescue, and target towing work. With all of its fighters headed overseas, the RCAF even designated some of its Lysander squadrons as fighter squadrons while waiting for replacement Curtis P-40 Kitty Hawks. But where the Lizzie was really to find its niche was with the number 138 Special Duties Squadron, which did missions for the Special Operations Executive, which did secret reconnaissance espionage, and sabotage work in occupied Europe. Although the SOE could insert agents by parachute, bringing in special equipment and taking out personnel, well, that required a special aircraft with exceptional short takeoff and landing qualities. Enter the Lysander Mark III SCW, Special Contract Westland. These Lizzies were painted all black, stripped of weapons, and had a big 150-gallon fuel tank strapped to the belly. The large radio was exchanged for a smaller one, which made more space in the back for two passengers, or even up to four in an uncomfortable pinch. They also had an external ladder fixed to the side of the fuselage to allow agents to quickly scramble into the airplane, as time was of the essence. But this special plane required special pilots for this very special work. Let's take a look. Pilots. Pilots for the Special Duty Squadron were often chosen by personal contact. A pilot would know of an above-average pilot, and he would be recruited into the secret organization. He had to be a good pilot and a great navigator, as he had to be able to find a farmer's field in France unaided in the dark. Training during the month-long course involved practice navigations during the day and then night, culminating in a final exam flight over France at night, where pilots were told to describe what they saw when they got to the designated location. If they said it was a prison camp, well, they had passed. Also important was the training of the agents themselves who picked the landing spots in France. They were trained to pick a field at least 1,800 feet long without trees or wires with firm ground and no mud. Mud was a major problem. 
In April 1942, a Lysander got stuck in the mud after landing, and even with the assistance of several teams of French oxen pulling, could not be retrieved, and the Lizzie was torched. A good landing field would be marked with three flashlights making an inverted L, and the crews trained to be on the ground for no more than three minutes. In total, the Lizzie's retrieved almost 600 agents, downed RAF or USAAF airmen, and brought them back to England. Survivors For an aircraft that seemed doomed so early in its operational history, it was operated by many countries, including Australia, Canada, Egypt, Finland, Free France, and South Africa, and was last flown in a conflict by the Egyptians in the 1947-1949 Palestine War. There are many surviving aircraft from India to Europe to the U.S., including some airworthy ones, such as the Lysander 3A, which flies out of the vintage wings of Canada in Gatineau, Quebec. I hope you've enjoyed this look at this very unconventional aircraft, and if so, please click me a like and a subscribe, and please share. The better these videos do, the more I can justify taking time to make more of them. Until next time.